Well, good morning, Disciples Church. Good to see you today. God is good, amen? What a joy to sing together and celebrate our good God. Do you grab your Bibles with me this morning and turn to the letter of James? You'll find it towards the back of your Bible, just after Hebrews, just before 1 Peter. If you don't have a Bible and need one, we have them in the back. We'd love for you to uh, dig into God's Word with us, get familiar with the text. Um, We're passionate here at Disciples Church about preaching through God's Word, making it about God's Word, not the ideas of man, to lift high what He has given us, that it would truly uh, change our lives, sanctify us in every way, um, ready us for this week that He has prepared. Lord willing, we wake up tomorrow, continue on our earthly pilgrimage to make much of His holy name. Uh, We're calling our series through James, Faith at Work. And today, I get the privilege to preach through uh, chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. Excited to do so, but as we dig in, will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. How great you are. You are worthy to be praised. You are good. You are just. You are love. You are wrath. We thank you for your grace. For we are an undeserving people. Lord, that you would move mightily in the preaching today of your word, but but also that you'd move mightily in the hearing. That we could strip away the distractions, the, the clutter, the things that we've allowed to become our main focus. That we'd return our focus to you. To be our joy, our our hope, our strength. That if we arrive in this place today burdened, struggling with sin, that we'd see it clearly, and as your word instructs us to, that we'd confess it, agree with you that it is sin, and repent to make a new way in light of the gospel. To take up a new path, a new practice for your holy name. For those, Lord, that might have come to this house today to hear the word taught and to, to join with the saints in fellowship and worship, Lord, that are yet to truly submit their lives to you as Lord, yet to truly believe not only who you are, but, but to trust you with their lives, that they would repent and believe this day and be saved that you, the mighty God, in your sovereign ways would, would move upon dead hearts and awaken them unto life. That you would ready us for the work to be done this week, the mission that you've called us to, the reason why you have not taken us home yet to continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to make disciples into all nations. Father, do not allow us to just do church this morning but prepare us to be the church this week. Hear your people, the praises of your people, the prayers of your people, and we thank you, God, that you are here and at work already. Move mightily, Holy Spirit, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter 2, verse 8 says this, If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. James continues to point out what faith at work looks like. What being doers of the word and not hearers only looks like as he continues his clarity that we are to show no partiality 
as we jumped into and worked through last week. This means that we are not to elevate ourselves or certain people or groups over another. To do this, in verse 8 and 9, he gives a simple comparison of if then. The first of those we see in verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, then you are doing well. He calls it the royal law. Do you catch that uniqueness? Can we just simply agree that the law of God is royal because He is supreme? There is no court higher than Him, no appeals beyond His rule and reign. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? The royal law is the great commandment, clarified by Jesus Himself as the synopsis of all the moral law of God, saying in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends all of the law and the prophets. All of the law. Synopsis in these two statements depicts the whole of God's law. We are to fulfill the law of God, not by unrighteous judgment of others, but by love and respect for others. Love for your neighbor is God's command on our lives. The opposite of this is self-serving thoughts or actions towards others. Let's stop and consider this for just a moment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why does he say, as yourself? That that's the measure of the love we should give. The reason why is because there's a natural thing in the way that God's made us to take care of ourselves. So It's in our wiring. For example, we pull away when there's pain. We eat when we're hungry. We sing when we're happy. But there's also a natural fleshly tendency to want to tend to ourselves before others. God's moral law causes us to fight this sinful, selfish drive in order to care for others first or to love others as ourselves as much as we care for ourselves. Paul said in Romans 12.3 that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought but to think with sober or or sound or God-honoring judgment. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 5, 28 through 30, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So how do we love others as we love ourselves? How do we make this our practice when our natural or fleshly tendency is to only love others when it benefits us? The answer is back in chapter 1, verse 18. You might look up the page there with me. The answer is we must be reborn. New birth is required. God must give us a new heart. New motivations to no longer be enslaved to sin and only do sin, but instead to serve God and to live out the fruit of the Spirit at work within us. James 1.15 says this, Of His own will, He brought us forth new birth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The answer to how you fight your flesh and not show partiality or judge others or not love them only based on what you get out of it is to first be loved by God. To be saved 
by him and set free from enslavement to sin. To have the Holy Spirit live and at work within you. John says this in 1 John 4, 16-19. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. Amen? We love because He first loved us. You won't love your neighbor as you love yourself. You can't unless you first know the love of God. You must be saved and set free from your enslavement to sin and only do according to your flesh. You must know the torrential downpour of God's love in your life. You must be saturated in it and transformed by it and have it move in and through you. You won't love selflessly without God's work in your life. You must confess to Him. Trust your life to Him and know Him. To walk with Him and live for Him. Oh, may it be so in your life this day and for the rest of your God-ordained days. James says, if you really fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But, look at verse 9. But, if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So he's giving us first a picture of what it looks like when God's love is at work in and through us, when we've been reborn, when there's evidence of faith at work, we will love our neighbors ourselves. And now he's going to turn towards an evidence of faith that's not at work, of of essentially not no faith, essentially that you still are a transgressor by the evidence of how you practice your life and the fruit of your life. Partiality is what... James just finished speaking about in verse 1 through 7. It was last week's sermon. You can catch it on our podcast if you missed it. And still much of the focus of the ongoing part of this leg of the passage. To define partiality quickly, again, the state or character of being partial, having bias or prejudice. As we talked about last week, God's word is clear that God is impartial. He shows no partiality, no judgment based on exterior preferences and and realities. God is interested in the soul, the state of where we are spiritually with him, and the fruit of the life that portrays that spiritual state, dead in sin or alive in Christ. It is prejudice or bias against a person for their looks or their culture or their ethnicity or their economic status or their social status, their mental capacity, their personal preferences. It is superficial judgment. It is sin. God is not partial, neither should we be. But in our flesh, we are. When our sin's at work, we are partial. 
way more than we want to admit. We don't even do this to people we don't know or don't like. We, we do it to people we know and love. We do it to each other as we run into each other. Partiality and our sin creeps out and wants to, wants to play out in our lives. It is a real and present sin that shows itself in our thoughts, our words, even our actions towards others. But to be made new in Christ, to have new motivations, a new way of thinking and acting out of His power, out of His love, transforms these things in us and begins to help us sanctify and grow and mature in these things. No other self-help or self-motivated work can do that internal transformation needed for, for your very motivations and reasons why you do what you do to change. James is clear to say here, if you practice partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law of God as a transgressor. Now to be clear again, he's not saying perfection. He didn't say if you ever do this once, then you're convicted. He's going to say that in another way. But what he's getting at is a practice. The emphasis here is a practice. The evidence of your life lived out, the lack of faith unto righteousness, but a practice in unrighteousness means that you're still in your sin. You're still a transgressor. You're still dead and apart from God. We see this clarity from John in his first letter, 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. John goes on in that same passage in verse 9 and 10. 1 John 3, 9 and 10. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Do we still sin? Yes. But that sin is covered by the blood of the Lamb. And those who are truly His confess it as sin and turn from it. Even if that's a season of fighting, the fight in you unto repentance proves that real saving faith is at work. To shed that and to go back into a lifestyle of practicing sin is to confirm that there is no saving faith. The evidence that we see in Scripture again and again of the lack of a truly newborn and transformed life. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. This is James' point. The practice of partiality, the ongoing practice of it, is evidence that God's seed is not in you. Your faith is not at work. It's not remaining. Your faith is superficial. See how John also links the practice of love for others and evidence of belonging to God, just as James does here in verse 8 and 9. He's saying your faith at work is shown in your ongoing practices. It's seen in the fruit you bear. Now James helps us see just how critical this is that we do business with these things. He shows us just how serious it is to be a transgressor of God's law. As we look to verse 10, a very famous and important passage in all of Scripture, James 2, verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has been guilty of all of it. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Let, let, that, let that sit with you for a moment. It's meant to be shocking. It's meant to not be something you hear casually. 
you might even honestly say to yourself, who can do this? No one is perfect. But I say that's not true. The Word of God says that that's not true, that no one is perfect. For there was one who was perfect. Amen? His name is Jesus. And as we are about to see, we are utterly desperate for His perfect record and sacrificial love. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become guilty of all of it. How can this be? It can be because the standard is not set or kept by mankind. The standard is set and kept by God. Mankind is guilty of it all when we fail at just one point of the law of God because God is perfect and holy. God's holiness is the standard of perfection. Not other men, God alone. This is the answer to the first question in our Word of Truth Catechism. Who is God? And if my little three-year-old was up here, I won't even try to say it like she says it because I'll butcher it. She, she, she says the core of these words and all these weird things. God is the almighty creator, sustainer, and ruler of everything. He is perfect. And the standard by which all things are measured. I'm going to pause real quick and tell you why it's cool that my three-year-old's learning that and what it's meant to our church. We, years ago, um, saw a need for uh, an up-to-date catechism that reflected the historic truths of Christianity, who God is and how he works and who we are and how we work and gospel and new life in Christ. And uh, You hear that word catechism, you might think... Um, Roman Catholicism, you might think liturgy or liturgical churches. And that is only because historically some of those churches have kept up the practice of catechism, but historically catechism is a Christian thing. And it simply is this. It's a short, simple question followed by a short, memorizable answer about deep and glorious truths of who God is and how he works. And it gets to be a wonderful foundation for our faith and to combat the lies of the world with the truths of God. I think there's 120-something questions in it. And we're about to embark on a journey together at our midweek gathering uh, just 10 days from now. Wednesday night, we also have a group that meets on Tuesday night. And the five of us in the teaching team will be bringing forth these truths one at a time and walking us through it, to lay a foundation. And those who have been through it with us once before will tell you in some of their 30, 40, 50 year journey of Christianity have never grown so solid in their foundation understanding the truths of God than through this effort. And uh, new believers who will say, praise God for this foundation laid. It's helping us be equipped to um, teach our kids and to equip them in the truths of God. It's one of our high aims to partner with you as parents as the primary disciple makers of your children and grandchildren. And that journey begins in 10 days, and we'd love to have you join us um, for the lecture at least. And if there's room or you're serious about becoming part of Disciples Church, then in some of the groups to follow a community that's happening. Tuesdays and Wednesday nights, get with our team in the lobby after church. Send us an email. I'd love to tell you more about that. Who is God? God is the almighty creator, sustainer, and ruler of everything. He is perfect, and the standard by which all things are measured. The economy by which we will be judged 
declares that God is the perfect standard and therefore perfection is what must be met to have fellowship with him. There is no 82% passing grade. 98% is not good enough. If eternity with God in glory is going to be any of our reality, then we must meet God's perfect standard. Church, we must see our sin in the proper way. Sin is often communicated in our day and culture as making mistakes or poor choices. But this is an insufficient view of sin. While any decision to sin is a poor one, that's true. We must do business with this. Because it's an act of disobedience against the holy and deserving God. R.C. Sproul, famous reformer, pastor, just passed away this last year said it well when he said, sin is cosmic treason. It's not just a mistake or a poor choice. It is is against the holy perfection and worthy honor of God. The slightest sin that a creature commits against the Creator is in direct violation to what the Creator is due in His holiness and perfection and glory and righteousness. Every sin, no matter how seemingly insignificant, is an act of rebellion against the sovereign God who reigns and rules over all things. It is an act of treason against the cosmic king we must make we must not make light or little of our sin we must see it rightly so that we see our savior rightly sin is falling short it's it's missing the mark but understand that the mark is not how we stack up person to person but how we stack up against the holy God. When we sin, we don't just miss the bullseye on the target, as we often kind of think we do. We fall short of the entire target, which is God's perfection, and are down in the dirt. It is not until we understand who God is in his perfection and holiness, that we gain a real understanding of the seriousness of our sin, the magnitude of it. Not until we take God seriously will we ever take sin seriously. But if we acknowledge the righteous character of God, then we, like the saints of old, will cover our mouths with our hands and repent in the dust and in the ashes before him. At the heart of all sin is a lie. A lie that says to all of us in our sin, the act you are now doing, the desire or the attitude that you are now feeling is not very bad because there's worse things. Not very bad because everyone else does the same things. Not very bad because you can't help it. Not very bad because there is no God. Or the lie may cause some to conclude, God knows that you are but frail and weak and he will tolerate or pity your sin. There are a thousand distortions of the truth which sin brings with it, the human heart. See, it's our feelings that are corrupt. It's our thinking that is corrupt. Jeremiah says clearly in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately corrupt. Who can understand it? This is why it is absolutely essential that you don't create your own economy for how you're doing with God. 
But you lean into the historic, proven word of God to define these things. How arrogant it is that we would say, no, I'm just going to step over here and kind of do this my way. And I think God's going to be good with that. We must understand that all sin is sin. All sin is a transgression against the holy, deserving authority and righteousness of God. His holiness is the standard, and everything that falls short of the holy standard is sin. We should not make light of our, of our hearts or, or our lives in sin. We should take sin seriously and see that it earns us death. It earns us eternal separation from God. I mean, if there was ever an example of this, it is the first sin of mankind. In all the ways that we love to play light with sin and excuse it and put it away because it's not a big deal, the sin that caused the fall of mankind was the eating of a piece of fruit. Right? Really? And if I pull that out of its context, and I just look at the eating of a piece of fruit, then I start to say, well, surely that's not a big deal, right? It's fruit. It's Sure, there's a little sugar, and maybe you're not trying to do sugar. Or... <laughs> and we do this. We come up with all these wonky ways of thinking about how things are okay, and it's not really that big of a deal, and the rest of it. It was a game-changing deal because God gave them everything and said, just don't do this one thing. Don't eat this fruit or you will surely die. He was absolutely clear. But we use sinful logic in, in our own deceiving hearts to, to decide the scale of what's bad or acceptable or not. Our culture does it all the time. Eh, it doesn't seem like a problem to me. Or we disregard the wisdom and instruction of the Lord, who's made clear what honors him and what doesn't. The sin that meant the fall and enslavement of the entire human race was the eating of a piece of fruit. Left alone, that sounds crazy. But it was a, an act of direct disobedience to what God declared they should not do. It is a huge deal that we have a right view of God, a right honoring of God. With as much as sin is at work, we love to excuse things we struggle with. But we need a better view of why it's bad in that why it offends God. The thing we must stop doing is measuring sin by how we feel or how we think about it. We must start seeing these things in relationship to the almighty creator, sustainer, and ruler of everything, who is perfect and the standard by which all things are measured. James 2.10, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Now you're starting to see why? Look at verse 11. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Let me clarify what he's not saying here. He's not saying that if you're guilty of murder, you are also guilty of adultery. No, you are a murderer. But the point is, because you failed to meet the holy standard of the law, you are guilty. You are a transgressor. Being guilty of murder or any single part of God's law is enough to make you guilty before God in all of his righteousness. There is no partial acceptance based on stellar performance in another area. I mean, I was really, I, I killed a man, but I was really faithful to my wife. I mean, it was, it was gloriously well done. You're guilty, you're guilty. Broke the law. Before God in his perfect standard. 
The holiness of God demands no stain in his presence. No matter how small, nothing of sin can come into his presence. We must made clean, be made clean through and through. We don't get to go stand before God and say, Hey, I kept all these things over here. So can you just overlook these things over here and then we'll be good? And the answer is no. You're guilty. If God overlooked any of it, he would fail to be just. He would fail to be holy. He cannot bring sin into his eternal presence. All sin must be justified and paid for fully, properly, and rightly if we are to be with him forever. This is sobering. Think about it with me. You can live your entire life perfectly and fail at the smallest thing to be unworthy of eternal heaven. Why? Because you fall short of the perfect and holy and eternal glory of God. And to say that this is too strict or not fair is to simply think too little of God and his sin in and of itself. It's to think too highly of yourself and mankind before God. To think too highly of the created, a fallen creation, before a perfect and holy and worthy God. And you might be thinking, well, man, to, our, to the culture, this is must sound nuts. It is to them, nuts. The Bible says it's folly to them. Who can understand it? In our sin, we must be reborn. We must be given eyes to see and ears to hear the, the sweetness of the beauty of God and the gospel that sets us free, the depth and reality of our sin that causes us to confess it and turn from it. Church, hear with me. Paul's most famous words in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of creation, all of created man, see the impossible reality to justify your damnable sin. See that it is impossible for you to justify it, to make it right, before the perfect standard. See that as Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. That we earn the paycheck of death because of our sin. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. Hear the weightiness of Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. God's holiness demands perfection. I want that to sit so real and, and vivid and present before you today. He cannot be compromised. I want you to understand that the perfect standard of God must be met. So then how? How? And the answer lies in that one man. That, that one man who lived a perfect life without sin. His name is Jesus.
Think about it with me. If only there was a way by which that perfect man named Jesus could exchange his record of perfect righteousness for my record of filthy transgressions and wicked self-righteousness. And, and if there was a way that that could happen, then what would it take for him who is perfect and deserving of all eternal praise and adoration to give up his standing to take on my deserved wrath a wretched sinner. What would it look like for him to show amazing grace to a totally undeserving sinner like me? Especially when he's under no obligation to give that grace, but is just and right and good and due to be praised for the execution of his wrath on guilty sinners. Well, Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. I paraphrase his opening words. He says, I share with you the most important news that has ever been shared with me. That Christ Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Amen? We call this the good news the gospel. There is no greater news that has ever been told to mankind because it is the news that God presented him, Jesus, God the Son, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. That's Romans 3.25. We call this penal substitutionary atonement. We Theologians have big old words that we like to use for this stuff. Let me break it down. Penal means he paid our due penalty. Isaiah describes his payment of our penalty this way. He was pierced. He was crushed. He was chastised. He was wounded so that we could be healed. He paid our due penalty. Substitutionary means he substituted himself in my place. That was my penalty he paid. I should have been pierced. I should have been crushed. I should have been chastised. I should have been wounded unto death, unto eternal death. But the spotless lamb, the perfect son, took on the sin of the sheep who had gone astray who did not meet the perfection of God's law. We were the ones who went astray, but the good shepherd came in order to lay down his life for his sheep. Isaiah 53, 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Luther calls this the great exchange. My death for his life. My sin for his righteousness. He takes on my condemnation and I get salvation. He takes on my failure and I get his success. He takes on my defeat and I get his victory. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He, God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen? 
Atonement means he absorbed the wrath of God that was due us. He took on our penalty, resulting in us receiving his righteousness, resulting in us having a reconciled relationship to God the Father. I'm here to tell you today the good news of Jesus Christ, that mercy triumphs over judgment in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To tell you that God chose freely to show us mercy instead of judgment because our wrath was met in the person, work, and victory of Jesus Christ on the cross. He chose to make a way for the greatest sacrifice to be given. Look at James 2, 12 through 13. So speak, my beloved. He's speaking to the beloved. He's speaking to the church, the redeemed, the born again, calling them not to show partiality, but to live out the law of God and loving others as yourself. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James is saying, your faith at work means love for your neighbor and not partiality and fleshly judgment. It means that while each of us is guilty of breaking all of God's law because we've broken at least one and many, that instead of judgment, he has put mercy on us who have confessed our sin and trusted Jesus as Lord Instead, he put his judgment on the perfect son in our place and put the perfect son's righteousness on us. Praise be to God. Romans 5, 8 through 11. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, not worthy of any of his grace, his love, any of it, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Verse 10. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The good news of Jesus Christ in the light of God's right execution of perfect obedience and our utter failure to do so is that mercy triumphs over judgment in that Jesus fulfilled the law so that we could live in liberty. So we are to go and to act as those who are judged under the law of liberty, under the gospel that has set us free. We are to live our faith and not live in our flesh. To not judge others with partiality and fleshly desires and aims and goals and self-making benefits, For we have not received grace and mercy if the evidence of showing others grace and mercy is not at work in our lives. That's what he says. Those who have been judged under the law of liberty are to proclaim the gospel to a world of death row walking condemned people and proclaim to them mercy triumphs over judgment. When, by God's grace, young or old, male or female, a person is given eyes to see the depth of their sin equaling eternal judgment. And in the very wake of that clarity, the beauty of the gospel that sets them free launching them unto confession of sin 
And a life that trusts Jesus, a life that serves Jesus, their Lord and Savior. That they see that mercy has triumphed over judgment. That is good news when you are on death row. Amen? The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for condemned people to say that in Christ alone, mercy triumphs over judgment. The unbeliever who does not know mercy does not know how to show mercy, but only judgment. Not true mercy, not real mercy, not lasting mercy. Mercy that an unbelieving person shows is still self-serving. At its best, it has a good aim, but it still falls so short of being for the glory of God. Nothing we do outside of Christ is for the glory of God. Therefore, it's all sin. The unbeliever who does not show mercy does not have the mercy of God. This is a warning for those to know. Again, your faith at work, in that you will show mercy to others, you will show love to others. This is what Jesus meant. Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It is not that we earn mercy by showing mercy. It is that God declares the evidence of the ones who are under his mercy are the ones who show mercy. Show the mercy they've been shown. Does this mean that we pardon sin? No, but it means we point to the only one who does. Jesus Christ. See the point is testimony. Church, you cannot just hear the sermon today and then go about your week quiet. His point is the mercy of God, the love of of God for others will make its way manifest in your lives. It is your faith at work. Do not be hearers only, but doers. This is what he is saying in all of this arc of this part of his letter. What testimony are you giving by the way you treat others? Who are you pointing to? If holding them in contempt and judgment for superficial things, then you prove to not be of God and lack to show the law of liberty, the gospel. But when you show mercy and love for others, because you've been shown mercy and love, especially when those are not deserving, we point them to the only hope they have, which is Jesus Christ. Amen? The only way they will know everlasting mercy and the love of God is Jesus Christ. Church, our living out our faith is important, not because it earns us anything, but because it means so much to those who are watching and because it tells the truth about who God is and what he's done in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. John MacArthur said it well in the sermon, when a man lives without mercy to others in God's world, he simply shows off the fact that he himself has never responded aright to the immeasurable mercy of God. The mercy a man has shown others as fruit of a life touched by God's saving mercy will triumph over judgment. His own sins, worthy of judgment, are removed by God's working in his life, dissolves all the charges strict justice might bring against him. Thus, his showing of mercy is not a matter of helping, of heaping up personal merit to deserve salvation by his own good works. The mercy he shows is itself a work of God for which he can take no credit. Our faith at work. The work of God in and through us at work. With this declaration, James brings to a conclusion his point of emphasis regarding partiality and the law of God. Partiality is inconsistent with the Christian faith because the Christian faith is consistent with the character of God who is impartial. 
sinful partiality is inconsistent with the royal commandment to love others as yourself. Even if it were the only sin you ever committed, you would be guilty of the entire law of God and therefore worthy of eternal judgment and death. If we belong to God because of the perfect substitutional work of Jesus and faith in him, we are not condemned by the law of our Lord, but pardoned by the law of liberty. Amen? The gospel of Jesus which not only sets us free, but is to be the testimony of our lives to a watching world. Church, this is not just for you today. It is for those whom God wants to hear your testimony of the gospel this week in what you say and do. Church, this is our faith at work. The gospel of our Lord. The truth of God. And if you're here today, have not yet done that true and right business with God to confess your sin, to confess that your very best falls short and that you are desperate for Jesus alone to be your Savior and Lord, that you are ready to die to yourself and live for Him. The Bible says repent and believe and you will be saved. And the work of God beginning to transform and grow you And it is our joy to walk with you. I pray this is true of you today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time and this place and this opportunity, Lord, to dig deep into your holy word, to see it at work in our lives, to be blessed and encouraged and confronted and informed that we can walk in obedience we can live out our faith and live out the things that you're doing in and through us and the transformation you're doing in our lives to change our character and our attitude and our desires and our motives and our actions Father that you would be glorified by us the church as we live out our faith and do this work that you've called us to and saved us to do And that there would be real confession and repentance of areas where we see with clarity by the work of the Holy Spirit today in your holy word that is sin, that that we turn from it, that a new beginning would happen today in these areas. It would be our joy to walk arm in arm with the body of Christ, to submit ourselves to the teaching of the holy word, and to have an eternal purpose for our days for the things that we do in raising our kids and running our businesses and in in, um, going about the world you've put us in. And we look forward with great anticipation for the new heavens and new earth to come, the feast with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we, we shout your name, we worship you on high this morning as we close. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and worship him.